Hey, greetings everybody, and a most happy Independence Day to you all. Today I have something very different for you all than my usual offering. This message is one that I plan to make something of an annual tradition. Uh, that is to say, to deliver some kind of Independence Day statement of celebration. Because if any holiday deserves to be celebrated, it is Independence Day. And the sad truth is, no one celebrates it anymore. But how can that be, I hear you asking? Well, every 4th of July, we always interface with the same old tired and increasingly meaningless traditions that occur across the country. Because today, countless people will mindlessly copy and paste the second sentence of the Declaration of Independence on their social media profile. In the gatherings around the country, the preamble to the Declaration of Independence will be read aloud to crowds of people who aren't listening and don't care. They are simply gearing up to watch the fireworks, which is entirely understandable. We all love fireworks, after all. They're real loud and they make things far away blow up real good. What's not to love? My point is that all around the country, all of these public readings of this truly amazing document are merely sound and fury, sanctifying nothing. And on those rare instances where we see anyone go beyond the simple recitation, what is offered up is just a superficial look, at the general philosophical principles such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And while each of these are indispensably important values worth honoring, as so often happens, the more we thoughtlessly hear and mindlessly repeat familiar concepts like those, the more their meaning degrades into a shallow and pedantic approximation of itself. They don't gain importance, and in fact, they do quite the opposite. So this year... I want to shake things up a little bit and give you a very different examination of the meaning, purpose, and importance of the Declaration of Independence. Rather than giving you another mere recitation and a shallow look at a philosophical framework contained therein, what I want to do is discuss one particular concept that can be found right in this document, next to the all-too-familiar concepts we all recognize, because there is an important message here hiding in plain sight that history overlooks the scholars refuse to acknowledge and that our government actively suppresses because its mere recognition is an existential threat to any member of the government who seeks to gain or hold in excess of power because this recognition alone leads to the uncomfortable and undeniable conclusion that the powers of government are fiduciary in their character and that these are just trustees necessarily and properly accountable to those who have vested trust in them. So what is this hidden concept in the Declaration, I hear you asking? Well, it's right in front of you if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, and it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new cards for their future security. And so what I am talking about is simply this, the right of revolution. Now, when reading the Declaration, it is worth keeping in mind two very important facts. First is that this document constituted high treason against the crown, and every person who signed it knew that they would be executed as traitors if they were caught by the British. And secondly, the Declaration was considered to be a legal document by which the revolutionaries would justify their actions and explain why they were not truly traitors. And so this document represented, as it were, a literal indictment of the Crown and of Parliament in the very same way that criminals are now publicly indicted 
for their alleged crimes by a grand jury representing the people. So let us always remember that treason is the reason for the season. Now, this is a document that not only condones but passionately advocates rebellion, sedition, and even treason. Now, that is not to say that an armed rebellion or treasonous acts are always justified. In fact, usually they are not, as the Declaration itself says. Prudence indeed will dictate the governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. So while the right to act in a rebellious and yes, even a treasonous manner it cannot be assumed, what can be assumed is the right to personally contemplate and even to publicly discuss when and if the time will or has come to take up arms and in the words of Thomas Paine, to begin the world anew. To consider the possibility that it is time to alter or abolish our system of government with whatever level of force is required, but no more than is necessary to bring about that change. And so today I want to declare my independence by claiming the right to fight for my independence should that day ever come. Now, despite... Joe Biden's repeated claims over the last four years that you can't be pro-insurrection and pro-America. You can't be pro-insurrection and pro-American. The fact is you can. And indeed, there may be times where you can't not be pro-insurrection and pro-America. Because it is to secure are rights that governments are instituted among men. Just as an individual may take up whatever actions he deems necessary to ward off his destruction or the perceived threat of his destruction, so too may a people act in their self-defense against a magistrate's lawlessness or viciousness. Now, as the great uh, Republican uh, rebel Algernon Sidney once said, whatever is lawful against a thief who submits to no law is lawful against a magistrate who submits to no law. And the fact is the American Revolution shows that the colonists were the true inheritors of the spirit of the glorious revolution and that they were indeed quicker learners of John Locke's lessons than even the ministers of George III. Now the complex of grievances and restless stirrings that agitated the Americans in the 1760s and beyond had sent their ablest men to their libraries and their writing desks, but by the mid-70s, events had reached a point where entreaties were futile and researches among old parchments and musty records would to prove to be superfluous. As Alexander Hamilton said, when the first principles of civil society are violated and the rights of a whole people are invaded, the common forms of municipal law are not to be regarded. Now, while the use of force and or coercion itself is not always justified, the fact is that its immediate predecessor is, namely sedition. Now, as I have argued before in past videos and articles, not only is sedition not a bad thing, sedition is a virtue. In fact, it is a uniquely American virtue. Now, this is evident in my most favorite of all Thomas Jefferson anecdotes. And it's one that can't help but leave me wondering how the hell it is that we went from that 
to this. Now, in 1804, the celebrated traveler, Buren Alexander von Humboldt, would call upon President Jefferson one day, and he was received into his office, and on taking up one of the public journals which lay upon the table, he was shocked to find his columns teeming with the most wanton abuse and licentious calumnies of the president. And so he threw it down with indignation, exclaiming, why do you not have the fellow hung who dares to write these abominable lies? Now, President Jefferson is said to have smiled at the warmth of the Baron's reply and would say, What? Hang the guardians of the public morals? No, sir. Rather would I protect the spirit of freedom which dictates even that degree of abuse. Put that paper in your pocket, my friend, and carry it with you to Europe. And when you hear anyone doubt the reality of America's freedom, you show them that paper and tell them where you found it. Sir, the country where public men are amenable to public opinions and where not only their official measures but their private morals are open to the scrutiny and the animate aversion of every citizen is more secure from despotism and corruption than it could be rendered by the wisest code of laws or best formed constitution. And party spirit may sometimes blacken, and its erroneous opinions may sometimes injure, but in general, it will prove the best guardian of a pure and wise administration. It will detect and expose vice and corruption, Check the encroachments of power and resist oppression. Sir, it is an abler protector of the people's rights than arms or laws. Now, at this, the Baron was said to reply. But is it not shocking that virtuous characters should be defamed? And Thomas Jefferson would reply by saying, let their actions refute such libels. Believe me, virtue is not long darkened by the clowns of calumny and the temporary pain which it causes is infinitely outweighed by the safety it ensures against degeneracy in the principles and the conducts of public functionaries. When a man assumes a public trust, he should consider himself as public property and justly liable to the inspection and vigilance of public opinion and the more sensibly he is made to feel his dependence, the less danger there will be of his abuse of power, which is that rock upon which good governments and the people's rights have so often been wrecked. So because celebrating independence is meaningless unless you live it, I hope today that each and every one of you will make a commitment to honor liberty by reclaiming liberty. It is not enough to simply celebrate your independence with the pomp and circumstance of footlong hot dogs and fireworks, though there's nothing wrong with either of those things. But I hope you will all celebrate your independence by living it. Now, allow me to defer to the wisdom of John Louis de Lome when he said, The power of the people is not when they strike, but when they keep in awe. It is when they can overthrow everything that they never need to move. And at a time where the following is spoken of, as an armed and violent uprising. Allowed in the Capitol for the last nine or 10 months. Because of the pandemic, this has been completely shut down. Not to mention that this breach means that there are, every single one of these protesters has not been screened. I mean, this is a, this is an unprecedented security breach on, in, in the Capitol, at least in my experience, where you have uh, so many people here who 
who have not been screened by Capitol Police, every single time you go into the Capitol, you go through a magnetometer, your bags are checked, and, and police do a sweep of, of what you bring into the Capitol. I would not be surprised if this video were spoken about by some as an act of treason. And while I wouldn't say that I agree with that conclusion, what I will say is this. If this be treason, make the most of it. And a happy Independence Day to you all. Thank you so much for tuning in. And of course, as always, Cartago de Lenda Est.